you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 14. And if you're a guest today or you're new to Eagle Heights, I want to let you know that we have been studying the book of Revelation. Now, I know that when we talk about the book of Revelation, it strikes a lot of different responses for a lot of different people. And that's most likely because there's so much misinformation and really even misinterpretation of this book, especially with all the symbolic language and all the colorful descriptions and all the mysterious beings. Uh, especially when you have people coming out and taking them to extremes, the interpretation to extremes. Some are creating this hellish, nightmarish landscape that is Revelation, and that is not the purpose of Revelation. Others have gone so far as to make it more of a mythical allegory. It's something we can learn from, but it's not actually going to take place. But that is also not the purpose of Revelation. See, the actual purpose of Revelation is, act, is found in the name. Something is being revealed. More, more importantly, someone is being revealed. Revelation is about one thing, the revealing of Jesus Christ. That's it. Throughout the book, the entire book, we're seeing new pictures of Jesus. In, in chapter 1, He is the risen Lord. John is again seeing his best friend for the first time after the resurrection. In chapters 2 and 3, he's the one. He's the one that is over his church. Now, think bigger than denominations. <clears throat> the church is those who put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It doesn't matter denomination at that point. And then we see in chapter 4 and 5, he's the, he's the lamb who was slain. We see that he and he alone is able to take God's eternal plan and put it into action. And then we get to chapter 6 through 18, and he becomes the righteous judge as he begins to enact God's eternal plan. We see him as the righteous judge taking over. Then we get to chapter 19, and he is the returning king. The book ends with him being the reigning king. So the entire book is revealing Jesus Christ to us. But along with that, as God is revealing Jesus to us, He's doing one other thing. He's giving man one last chance to respond to the truth about Jesus before He brings the world to its ultimate conclusion. That's what one of the main purposes of Revelation is. Now, before we step into reading this book, and you're new to this, let me tell you what kind of book we're studying. Revelation is what we call prophetic writings. It's a prophetic book. Now, that means it's not like a history book. It's not like Genesis or Exodus or Acts. It doesn't follow a strict chronological order. See, in prophetic writings, the author is going to take the reader on a prophetic journey, and that is going to move in, and it's going to move out of chronological order. So in Revelation 14, we're moving out of chronological order. We're looking forward to the very end of the tribulation where Jesus Christ is returning and it's summarizing this event. That's what's happening in Revelation 14. Now there's a purpose why it's doing that. It is intentionally pointing us to that event so we can see man's eternal destinies. We can see people's eternal destinies. That's the whole point of Revelation 14. So let's go to Revelation 14, verse 1. If you got the notes, you can follow along there. It'll also be on the screen. Turn on your Bibles. There's multiple ways. Notice what it says. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb. Now that's Jesus. He's standing on Mount Zion. I believe that to be Jerusalem. And with him, 144,000. Now, we've already seen these. These are the witnesses from chapter 7. These are people who have been chosen by God. They're Jewish witnesses that will live throughout the entire seven-year tribulation. The 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. Music is starting. And they, the 144,000, sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Verse 4. 
These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. Doesn't mean they didn't get married, it just means they were virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They were blameless. Now notice how chapter 14 begins. It begins by describing for us, look at point one, we see the description of those who've decided to follow Jesus. Now notice as Christ, remember where we are, we're coming to the end of the tribulation. Christ has returned. He's standing on the ground. There to meet Him, standing with Him, are these 144,000. So the first thing we see about them is they're standing with Christ at the end of the tribulation. Now, the standing with Christ is important because they're standing in triumph with Him. They're standing victorious with Him because they have endured the entire tribulation. Now, if you don't know what that term tribulation means, let me give you as clear a definition as I can. The tribulation is the final seven years of life on earth, time on earth for those who have not believed in Jesus Christ. See, this is the end of the game. This is the final moments of the clock ticking off. Many of you watched your favorite teams play yesterday. And the best time of that or the worst time of that is the fourth quarter, isn't it? If your team is down, watching those minutes tick away, you know quickly this game's about to end and they're going to lose. But if your team is winning and those clock, as the clock ticks down, you know, okay, they're about to win. Well, what we see here, we see that the final seven years of time, God is bringing everything to conclusion. The clock is ticking off. And notice what we see at the end. These men and these women are standing with God victoriously as God is bringing everything to conclusion. Now, during that seven-year period, we call it the tribulation, the world is going to be taken over by a madman, a dictator, who's going to create a one-world government in which he is the sole dictator. Now, many of you have heard his name. It's the Antichrist, his title, actually. But he's also going to do something else. He's also going to create a one-world religion where he deceives everybody into worshiping him. Now, here's how he's going to do it. He's going to fake his death. He's going to appear to be assassinated. He's going to go to the grave for three days, and then he's going to appear to resurrect. Now, it's going to be so convincing that people will automatically believe it and they'll declare him to be the Messiah. And then he's going to take the craziest step you've ever heard. He's going to force people to take a mark of loyalty. That's where we get the mark of the beast, 666. That's what that means. It's a mark of loyalty. Now, a lot of people will willingly take that mark. They will willingly obey Him. They'll willingly honor Him. They'll willingly worship Him. They will say, He's God, and I'm giving my life to Him, and I'll follow Him. Now, a lot of people will not. There will be a lot of people who refuse to do what He's asking. And as a result, notice what's going to take place. They, many of them, will give their life to die. Many of them will suffer death. So, these 144,000 have endured this time of tribulation. But it's not just been the pursuit of Antichrist. See, at the same time tribulation is going on, God is sending judgment upon the earth in those last seven years. The earth, which once took care of man and provided man blessing, is now turning on man. The Bible also says that the system, that government, that Antichrist sets up, is there to oppose God and and oppress His people. And then finally, the worst part is that the Bible's going to, re- or the God's going to remove all restraint. And the lawlessness of man is going to be in complete and total chaos. Men will turn on other men. And the world is going to be descending into a, a state it's never even seen before. And here we are having these 144,000, and they have endured this entire time. So understand, I've gone through all this, and now Jesus is returning. He's returning to claim His kingdom. They're meeting Him here, and they're standing in this victory. They got through it. They endured it. I want you to think of the victory, the triumph that they have 
like, like the medal stand at the Olympics. We had the Olympics this year. And we saw that at the end, the winners, those who got are victorious, take their place. They either get the gold, the silver, or the bronze. And what have they done? They've endured to the end. They've been victorious over everyone else. They've triumphed. That is the picture here. Yeah, and that would be easy for us to think that these are some kind of special gifted people. That maybe they have some ability we do not. Or, or somehow they've turned on some strength internally that, that maybe you haven't discovered yet. It almost is for us to sit back and stand in awe of this group. But we shouldn't. Because this group is a group that is just like you and me. And the only reason that they're able to stand in victory, the only way they were able to endure the tribulation is because they had learned something very, very important about God. So they learned that God is a God of love. Now we know that. We hear that all the time. Matter of fact, it's the number one way people anywhere describe God. God is a God of love. But we need to understand something about God's love. It's incredibly unique to Him. It's called unconditional love, meaning that God chooses to love us. Now, why is that important? Because we have nothing on our side that allows us to build a relationship with God. All the commonalities that we share that help us connect with each other in relationship to help us fall in love does not exist with God. There is no common desire and ability that, that can come. We're not, it's not based on desirability. We don't desire Him, Scripture says. It says that there's nothing that we have in common interests. God created the world. We kind of messed it up. We don't have common interest with God. We don't have similarities with God. He's completely different from us. We have no emotional connection with God. Every single thing that would build a relationship can't because the Bible says we're apart from Him and we don't want Him. It's not God, it's us. So God, in that state where we didn't want Him, decided to choose us. Now here's the cool thing about God's love. Because I had nothing to do with it. I didn't have any part in forming it. Neither did you. I did nothing to earn this, and I can do nothing to make God stop loving me. See, before the tribulation began, these are unbelievers. These 144,000 don't know God. They don't believe in God. They refuse to believe in Him. They've rejected Him. They refuse to, to honor Him, and they refuse to obey Him. That's who they are. But when they saw the love of God, when they discovered that God is love, they willingly bowed down and believed in Him. See, it was the love of God that allowed them to be saved. Now, how do we know that, Brad? We don't see it in here. Where does it say the love of God? Well, it says it in Romans 2.4. It says that it was the kindness of God, and that's an expression of His love. It's one of the facets of it that leads us to repentance. They saw that love. They saw His kindness. They saw how amazing He was. And they put their faith in Him. And it was Him that was able to allow them to stand throughout this time. So much so that when Christ arrives, notice what they start doing. They start singing to Christ. They start singing to Christ. That's point B. Now, that may sound strange, but we need to understand what's taking place is they're singing to him. Now, I told you that the last seven years is called the tribulation. Now, during that time, God is going to be doing something for man. God is going to be giving a preview of what the price of sin is going to be. Now, we need to stop and talk about sin for a second. What is that? I'm, uh, now, when you think of sin, many of us think of sins. We think of behaviors, actions. We start thinking of bad things. But the Bible doesn't start talking with us about sins. It's talking about sin. See, we are all born in sin, not in sins. We are all born sinners. Well, what does that mean? That naturally, naturally we reject God. We naturally reject Him. We absolutely refuse to honor Him as God. We know He exists. We refuse to worship Him. And because we refuse that, we resist obeying Him. 
Okay, I naturally reject him. I, I naturally am not going to honor him. And I'm naturally not going to obey him. See, that's sin. Now, Christ said that sin has a price. That price is death. Now, when we hear death, we think physical death. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about spiritual death. Why? Because all of us die. But not all of us die spiritually. So if you want to describe spiritual death, let me tell you exactly what it is. In its purest form, it is separation from God for eternity. It is separation from God for eternity. Now understand what's going on here. God is offering man a choice. We're going to look at that in a minute. But you've rejected God. You refuse to worship Him. You resist obeying Him. You've told God this, I don't want you. Well, in eternity, God's honoring that choice. God's not going to force you to be in His presence. Not, God's not going to drag you to heaven and say, sit down, you're in time out, learn to love me. No, God's giving man what man has chosen. Man has chosen separation from God. But remember what the tribulation's about. God's giving man a preview of what that death's going to look like. So all of a sudden, man, before he actually has to step into that separation, gets to experience some of it. So what are they going to experience? God's wrath. They're going to experience God's torment. Now the torment there is not going to be the physical torment. The Word emphasizes the spiritual emotional side, meaning you're going to spend eternity realizing I made the wrong choice and it's my fault because I said no to God. That's the point of it. I rejected him. I refused him. I resisted him. So these 144,000 are looking across the tribulation. They've survived it all. They see the preview of the price of sin. They've seen the wrath of God. They see the torment men have chosen. And they know one thing. It was the love of God that rescued them. How else would you think someone who rescued you? The moment he shows up, they just start thanking him. They start worshiping him. They start praising him, saying, thank you that I didn't go through this. This was a nightmare. You rescued me, and I'm going to sing this to you. But it also points out something else. They're not just singing to Christ. They begin to serve Christ and serve Christ alone. Now notice how they do this. Look at verse 1. It tells us clearly that they are separated. Now don't get this confused. It means simply this, that they're sealed. They are sealed. In this case, they have the Father's name written on their forehead. See, one thing God wants you to know, when you accept Jesus Christ, He wants you to absolutely know that you belong to Him, that you're His. That there's no question. So what does he do? He seals us. Right now, here's what he says. The moment you put your faith in me, I send the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, to dwell in you. Now notice what this Holy Spirit's job is. His ministry has so many functions, but one of the primary ones, he tells us, he confirms in us that we're his children. So you have no question if you belong to him. Do you guys remember the first Toy Story movie? Do you remember when Buzz shows up? Buzz is convinced he's actually a space ranger. And Woody keeps talking to him like he's a toy. And he can't convince him. And it's finally at the end when Woody pulls up his boot and he shows it to Buzz and shows him the name Andy written on his foot. He goes, listen, we belong to Andy. I be we belong to him. That's exactly what it's like for the believer. I know the Holy Spirit is in me, and because He's in me, because I have a changed attitude, because I'm convicted for sin, because I have power to follow, obey, and do what God says, because I have new identity, new purpose, new meaning, since I've changed, I know for sure I belong to God. Holy Spirit is there confirming that consistently. You know what that means? God wanted to make sure that it didn't depend upon your actions. It was confirmed by His presence. See, I don't have to look back to 1978 in November when I prayed to receive Jesus Christ. I can look right now and absolutely know I've met Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Because Christ lives in me through His Holy Spirit. Did you know 
that we had a charter member of our church this week lost his precious wife, was confronted with mortality, has believed himself to be a Christian all these years, but when he came down to it, he kept going back to this moment back here instead of being able to sit back and say, these things don't connect because I'm missing something now. And Johnny Johnson prayed to receive Jesus Christ this weekend. See, you can be sitting there this whole time saying, I prayed, I did this, look at all the things I'm doing. It doesn't matter what you've done. I don't look to what I do. I ask one question. Is the Holy Spirit present in me? See, they were sealed. They knew. When they believed in the love of God and they put their faith in Him, they knew because the Holy Spirit was in them, which also allowed them to do something else. They were steadfast. Notice what it calls them. They consistently followed Jesus Christ. You know why they were able to do that? Because they found the truth about Jesus. Jesus that there's no king like him. Think about Jesus. He created everything. He owns everything. He is sitting in heaven. He deserves worship. He deserves obedience. And he loves us. And we reject him. We refuse to honor him. Resist obeying him. Stay away from me. Now that sin separated us from God. Now, as the king of the universe, he has the right to do with us as he wishes. Because the price for that's death. But, but he didn't do that, did he? He didn't enact judgment immediately. Instead, he gave up his position. He gave up his right to worship. He gave up his right of recognition. And he came to earth to live just like we did. And then he went to the cross and died for the very people that spit in his face and rejected him. And then after he rises out of the grave, he says, I want you to be my children. Find me a king like that in history. Any king. There is none. They knew the truth about Jesus Christ, and that's why they are sincere. See, they are sincere. There's no hypocrisy in them. Understand what that means. They're not perfect. But their words and their actions reflect a life that has been changed by Jesus Christ. That's why they're sincere. But then we take a weird change and a quick shift, and it starts talking about the destruction of Babylon. Look what it says. Then I saw another angel flying in midair. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. To every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Now notice what we see here. We see an angel flying around heaven, or flying around the sky, we see this angel preaching the gospel. Now, why would God have an angel preaching the gospel? Because men have stopped listening to human witnesses. So God is sending an angelic being to get their attention. Isn't it funny? When men close their ears, God is still trying to open their eyes. And He's preaching the gospel. He's letting men know, you're a sinner. You have rejected God. You've refused You've refused to give Him honor through worship and you've resisted obeying Him. And the price of that is death. But there's no reason to die because Jesus Christ has already died. He's already come. He's already given His life. He rose out of the grave and now He's offering you eternal life. But see, it's not enough to just know that. See, I can know that and agree with it, but the Bible says I have to receive it from Him. Imagine This is pretend that you were convicted of a capital crime. You had your court case. You were convicted. You were were charged, convicted, and you were judged guilty. And then they condemned you to say, you're going to die. And you're sitting in your cell, and all of a sudden a man shows up. And he said, listen, I love you. I'm ready to take your place. I'm going to die for you. That sounds great. But you know what you got to do? Agree to that. 
You've got to be willing to leave the cell. You've got to receive His gift. So here we have this angel. He is preaching this gospel so man can know the truth so they can receive it because God's trying to still rescue man. But then all of a sudden, notice what else is being pronounced here. Judgment. Now wait a minute, Brad. We said God's a loving God, but we see wrath and we see judgment. How can those things exist together? There's no way that these two can come together. Doesn't God's wrath and judgment deny His love? I'm going to say it doesn't. I'm going to say God's wrath and judgment proves His love. Let me tell you why. Think of it this way. Consider this. A God of love must hate anything that harms what He loves. Let me ask you a question. You're a parent. You're a spouse. You have friends. And you love those people. If you saw them being harmed and you had the ability to do something, would you step in? Of course you would. You would do what you had to do, go to any extent to stop what's taking place, and then you're going to make sure the person doing that is going to be judged. Why? Because you love that person. Because you love them, you enact wrath and you enact judgment. See, a God of love must take action to protect, to protect the innocent. See, a God of love must mean business when he declares something off limits. See, a God of love must have the capacity for wrath. Now, it's not like man's anger. It's controlled, it's deliberate, it's measured, and it's his response to sin. So when we look in Revelation, what do we see? We see God showing man, this is what I'm going to do to sin. When we look at that, we go, Brad, God's wrath is a scary thing. I don't want to go to that. I need you to understand, God's wrath is not a future thing. God's wrath is an ever-present reality. Listen to what Romans 1.18 says. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Now, it doesn't say it's going to be. That's present tense. Is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what, we, what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that no man, no people are without excuse. Now, if we read those words, we say, okay, wait a minute. Ungodliness? That word wickedness actually means unrighteousness? What does that mean? I'm not ungodly and unrighteous because we go to, remember what we go to? We go to sins. And we pick some sins that are really bad. But those words are not talking about sins. They're talking about sin. Do you know what ungodliness is? Ungodliness is this. It's the refusal to honor God. I will not worship you. I will not bow to you. Do you know what unrighteousness is? I refuse to obey you. I resist that. Notice what it says. Anyone who's living their life saying, I'm not going to worship God, I'm not going to obey God, is automatically under the wrath of God. Meaning what? That God is working right now to let you see the price of sin so you'll walk away from it. Why? Because He loves you. And because He loves you, He's going to punish the thing that's hurting you and tries to separate it from you. And notice what happens. These are people who are suppressing that truth by their un righteousness. Stop right there. Every single time I tell God, no, I won't obey you. I don't want you. I reject you. Your heart draws further and further and further and further from Him. This entire chapter ends with hearts so hard and minds so dark that they're not only doing the worst, most impossible actions, the sins, but they're celebrating anybody else who does it, and they're encouraging people to do it. They're dragging people along with them. Please understand, the wrath of God exists right now against sin, because God hates sin, and God loves 
you. And He wants to separate you from the thing that is causing the greatest problem in your life and the greatest problem in, your, in the society. It's the heart of man. Jesus said, out of that heart, every wicked thing we deal with in this earth, that's where it comes from. That sin nature. But then we see something else. We see a promised destruction of Babylon. We're, we're going to go into this in the next several weeks, but understand what this is. Babylon is simply this. It is the ultimate symbol of sin. It is the ultimate symbol of ungodliness. It is the ultimate symbol of unrighteousness. And as Christ is saying, you will see a physical destruction of the world empire knowing that God is going to bring down all ungodliness and unrighteousness. It will be dealt with. God will judge sin because God loves man. But this book ends with the destiny, the destiny of those who have rejected Jesus. Notice what happens here. A third angel followed, verse 9, and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their foreheads or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength into the cup of His wrath, the entire full wrath of God. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest or night for those who worship the beast in its image. For anyone who receives the mark of its name, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the God's children who keep His commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. During the tribulation, a deceived people will re- receive the Antichrist as the Messiah. They will worship Him and honor Him as Messiah and they will willingly obey Him and they'll take His mark. They've been deceived into following a false god. And we think of that because, man, I don't want to do that. You know, it's funny today, we still have a deceived world that is rejecting the real Messiah. The true Messiah. The only Messiah that can save you. And we see the comparison. These are sealed by the beast. But we also see the last point, the most important point. They're compared to those who are sealed by the Father. Notice what happens to those who are children of God. They find rest. They find reward. But notice to those who aren't. You live eternally under God's wrath. And you lived eternally under His punishment of sin. Now I need to stop you right there and listen. Listen. Hear me. It's because you chose it. See, you have a choice today. You're free to choose, but you're not free to not choose. To not choose is to reject Jesus. To look Him in the face and say, I reject you. I refuse to honor you as God and I resist to obey you. You go do your thing, I'll go do mine. To say that to God, to resist Him, to say I refuse to choose is to reject Jesus and say I want to pay for my sin by myself. And you've already seen that price. Let me ask you a question right now. Is that how you want to spend your eternity? This whole story is about eternal destinies. We see two laid out here. We see these group of believers who put their love, they they knew the truth about Jesus' love, so they put their faith in Him. And compared to those who did not. See, there's only two choices. You Brad, I don't like that. I don't think that's fair. No, what you're actually saying is, I don't agree with that and I want my own way and I demand that God give me what I want, which is another way of saying, God, I refuse to obey you. Today, you can know for sure where your eternity is. How? Simple. You admit you're a sinner. You admit you deserve what Christ says. You admit you can't rescue yourself. You come and you put your faith in Jesus Christ's sacrifice and nothing else because He and He alone is the one who can rescue you. 
And then you confess Him. I mean, you tell Him, Lord, I want you to save me and I want you to lead me. I'm not just trying to get out of hell, God. I'm not just trying to get into heaven. I want to leave who I was and I want you. Because I don't have life apart from you. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if that is you this morning, I want to lead you in a prayer. The band is making their way to the stage. We're getting ready to have an invitation. But before that invitation begins, I want to give you an opportunity to pray, to put into words the very phrasing I just said. If that's you, say it with me this morning. Pray it in your own words, but just tell God. Say, God, I admit I'm a sinner. Just tell Him that right now. I admit that. I admit I deserve to pay for my own sin with my own life. Jesus, I admit that You are the only one who can save me. So Jesus, I'm putting my faith in You. I'm choosing to receive the gift of life You've offered. You've said Your death counts for me. And I want it to count for me today. So Lord, I'm telling You, I'm asking you, I'm believing in you. Be my Savior and be my Lord. Thank you, Jesus.